Hi everybody, Dan Bailey here with another super fun photography tip for you. In my previous lesson, I shared with you my exact method for ensuring proper exposure when shooting with mirrorless cameras. The tips I shared in that video apply whether you're shooting Fujifilm or any of the other mirrorless brands of cameras out there as well. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that tutorial, you might want to click this link and check it out. In this video, I'm going to share with you even more essential tips and techniques that you can use to ensure proper exposure uh, when you're shooting in tricky and challenging light. And these tips are universal. They apply whether you're shooting with mirrorless cameras or DSLRs, film cameras. These are the methods that I've always used in my photography, even from my early days when I shot film. So to recap, most of the time I'm shooting in aperture priority mode, and I'm looking at my scene through the electronic viewfinder or on the LCD screen in the back of the camera. And if I like what I see, then I press the button and take the picture. However, if what I'm seeing on the screen isn't quite what I want, maybe the picture's too bright or too dark, then I'll simply grab the exposure compensation dial and make an adjustment. If it's too dark on the screen, then I'll go up a few clicks. And if it's too bright, then I'll go down. And as I'm making these adjustments, I'm looking at the viewfinder. And when I get to the point where I like what I see, I take the picture. And that's the beauty of using mirrorless cameras. It's really that easy. It doesn't have to be complicated. And this works because what you're looking at in the viewfinder is a direct feed that's coming straight off the sensor. And as I explained in the last lesson, this method also works for the other auto modes on the camera, like shutter priority and program. And for the most part, that technique will get you by in a lot of situations, but it obviously won't get you by in every situation. When the light gets really challenging, or if you're dealing with very high contrast scenes, then you're gonna have to make use of some other techniques to get you by. There's also manual mode, and I covered this in the last lesson as well, and I explained why you might want to shoot with manual mode in certain situations. So now let's dive in even further and talk about some of the other tools and techniques you have available to help you get proper exposure when the light gets tricky. Okay, now we're getting a little bit more complicated, but not really. Let's talk aperture and shutter speed. How do we bring those into the mix? And depending on your scene and what you're going for in your picture, you might want to use a faster or slower shutter speed to freeze or blur the motion. Other times you might want to choose different aperture settings in order to achieve very wide or very narrow depth of field in your photo. If your camera is set to aperture priority mode, you can control both of those parameters, shutter speed and aperture. You simply turn the aperture ring until you see whatever f-stop or shutter speed that you want for the shot. And the camera will do its part and change the shutter speed according to what f-stop you have set and you can see that right in the display info in your camera. So for most shooting situations, I point my camera at the scene and I think about how I want the picture to look. Do I want it to be sharp or blurry? Or do I want it to be, have a wide depth of field or a very shallow depth of field? And then I adjust the aperture and pay attention to the shutter speed and aperture combination I have set in the viewfinder. And then I simply adjust the aperture ring until I get an aperture or a shutter speed that I know will give me that result. So in this photo, I knew I wanted a very fast shutter speed. So I just cranked the aperture dial all the way open, which gave me f2.8 at 640th of a second. And I knew that would be a fast enough shutter speed to freeze the action. For this next photo, I knew I wanted a, a blurry silky water effect. So I set the aperture to f16, and that gave me a shutter speed of three seconds, which was long enough to blur the water. And thinking about the relationships between aperture and shutter speed, we know that if we open the aperture all the way up to say f2.8, that's going to give us a very shallow depth of field, and it's also going to give us a very fast shutter speed. Conversely, if we stop down to f16, we know that we'll get a very wide depth of field effect and a much slower shutter speed. So when I'm shooting some scenes, I don't even pay attention to my numbers. If I'm shooting action, I might just whip the aperture ring all the way open, knowing that's going to give me a fast shutter speed. And if I'm shooting a blurry water scene, I'll just stop all the way down knowing that that's going to give me the slowest shutter speed possible. I don't even need to be concerned with exactly what the numbers are. And sometimes if neither of those things are very crucial, uh, I might end up somewhere in f8 or f11 or f5.6. It really just depends what you're shooting. Okay, let's bring ISO into the mix. If you're shooting a scene and your current ISO setting won't give you the specific aperture or shutter speed value that you want, then you can simply make an ISO adjustment up or down. Now, I usually prefer to change my ISO manually. You could use auto ISO and eliminate this step, and that's probably preferable. 
In this situation, I was photographing crows flying around the trees uh, early in the morning when the light was very dim. Now I was using the Fuji 200 f2 lens, which meant that I would need a very high shutter speed in order to freeze the action of the flying birds. So I simply cranked the ISO dial up to 1600, and that gave me a fast enough shutter speed that I was able to create a sharp photo of these flying birds. So when we think about ISO, it's really as simple as that. Need more speed? Crank the ISO dial up. What about the histogram? How does that play into all this? The histogram is just a graph of all of the tones in your image. Without going into too much technical detail, basically the rule of thumb is that you don't want to have huge spikes or huge gaps near the edges, either the right or left side of the histogram. If you have a huge spike at one end of the histogram, that means either your shadow detail is lost or your highlights are blown. Now blown out highlights usually don't look great in photos, but a lot of times deep, dark, rich shadows with no detail looked awesome in photos. So with that in mind, I like to use the histogram as a guide. I put a histogram right in my viewfinder and I can use it for visual reference. So if I'm looking at the scene in my viewfinder and I like the scene, but I'm seeing a huge spike, that means that something is blown out or something's lost. And I can either compensate or I can decide, well, that's okay, I'm okay losing that. If there's a situation where I can't seem to get the right ratio of tones, for example, maybe I have blown out highlights, but pulling those back darkens the subject too much, that might be a situation where I shoot raw. For you Fuji shooters, that might be an excellent opportunity to make adjustments to the highlight or shadow tones. Now, I don't know if other cameras have those kinds of controls. If your camera has a highlight or shadow tone control or something like that, that's when you would use it. You also don't want a huge gap in the right side of the histogram. Due to the way that camera sensors capture light, there's more tonal information in the brighter areas of your scene than in the darker areas. This means that a brighter photo generally has more latitude for showing details and allowing for more finer tuned processing uh, than a dark image does. You might have noticed that if you're trying to rescue really dark tones and brighten up a very dark image, you tend to introduce noise into the photo, much more so than if you're brightening an already bright image. Another reason to use the histogram is that you may not always be able to trust the LCD screen, or you might not be able to see it clearly. Trying to gauge exactly what your photo is going to look like on the screen when you're shooting in bright sunlight can be very difficult. So having a histogram for reference on the screen as well can be a big help. In addition, not all cameras have the same level of quality in the LCD screens. I have full confidence in the quality of the screens that are on my Fuji cameras, and I think that most high-end cameras are going to have very good screens that you can trust. However, there are definitely cheaper cameras out there on the market that don't have 100% accuracy on the screens. So it's very simple to incorporate a histogram into your exposure workflow. Simply set up your camera so that it displays a histogram in the viewfinder and use that for reference while you're shooting. As you're looking at the viewfinder and making exposure decisions, just check the histogram for any huge spikes or gaps and make adjustments accordingly. Ideally, you want your histogram to be a nice gradual bell curve that extends across the entire range of the graph. However, that's not always going to happen. What if you're shooting a bright snowy scene or an excessively dark shadowed scene? You're going to have a huge amount of information clustered on one side or the other, depending on how the scene looks. And this is okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. Again, just use it as a guide. And as I said before, if you're shooting a very high contrast scene, it might be unavoidable to get spikes on one end or the other of your graph, or both. In this kind of situation, just dial in what looks best and take the shot. Or shoot raw and go home and process later. That's another good alternative. Being a great photographer still requires a high degree of proficiency and experience with the camera. It takes being able to analyze your scenes quickly and knowing exactly how to adjust your cameras to reflect that current situation you're trying to photograph. And all this is happening while you're trying to gauge the light, anticipate the action, trying to figure out what creative ideas you want for this scene and how to make it happen. It's not easy, but it gets easier with time, experience, and lots of practice. Thanks so much for watching this lesson. I hope you found it helpful. Feel free to leave me a comment below, and please share my channel with your other photographer friends. If you'd like even more insight from me, please check out my selection of ebooks, which you can find on my blog. I've got a number of different titles that cover a variety of subject matter and styles. Also, please subscribe to my channel and check out some of my other videos. You can find me on Patreon and social media at Dan Bailey Photo and you can visit my website and blog as well. So thanks again for watching. Have fun with your cameras out there. Good luck with your exposure. I'll see you next time.